Hi, everyone, and welcome back again. We're so pleased that you've decided to join us again. We have a repeat guest for today, one of our very, very favorites. That's why he keeps coming back, because <laughs> we love him to pieces. Harry Rowe is with us today. He is an extremely talented author, an author of many, many books. And if you haven't read any of his books, I really urge you to grab anyone you choose. Just grab it off the shelf and take it home with you and read. Gary, before we get started talking about your new book, would you give our readers, our listeners, a little bit of a background, please? Sure. Uh, hello, everybody, first of all. And um, it's good to be back. I, I really came from a background of loss. You know, people, people ask sometimes when they hear uh, author, speaker, grief specialist, they're like, number one, what is that? And number two, how in the world did you get into that? I had a number of losses uh, early in life, uh, a number of losses as a, result, as a result of sexual abuse, as a result of family trauma, uh, a number of deaths in our family, uh, the death of a best friend when I was 12, the separation and divorce of my parents when I was 13, my mom slipping into mental illness that really left me with one functioning parent, which was my dad, and then he died suddenly of a heart attack when I was 15. And so I was functionally orphaned and brought into a home by another family. And that really, at 15, I, I can say my healing journey began at 15. But of course, when we say that, we know that as we get older, more and more losses come our way. Right. So really, it was just learning how to handle the losses that came without trying to anticipate them too much, you know, waiting for the next shoe to drop because you're used to shoes dropping on you. Right. And um, so that led really to a, an, an adult life of helping, trying to help myself heal and grow mm -hmm. and helping other hurting, grieving, grieving people heal and grow. I yeah. uh, spent a number of years as a college minister and then as a missionary in Japan and then two plus decades as a pastor. And then for 12 years, I was in hospice ministry as a hospice chaplain and grief counselor. And uh, now I'm I've just, I guess, about six months ago, uh, launched fully into just being a full time writer, speaker and helper of people in grief. And again, many, many books, every one of them perfect for anyone who's grieving and others. If you want to understand the grief process better, I encourage you also to grab hold of these books. It will make you a better support person, so to speak, if someone you know is going through grief as well. Anything we can do to learn a little bit more about it, it's an incredible process and one really that you can't fully understand unless or until you go through it yourself. Right. As well, for every person you lose, or pet even, um, for everyone you lose, the process is different. Mm-hmm. I have lost an infant child. I've lost my mother, my father, my husband, most recently, some friends, obviously some acquaintances, but every single loss is different and impacts me in a different way. Yes. So enough about me. Let's talk <laughs> about your brand new book, Hope in a World Gone Mad, Finding God in Grief, Fear and Uncertainty. This has been out now, what, just a few weeks, Gary? Uh, yes, just, um, I guess, right at the beginning of December. So okay. well, we're talking about a month and a half, I guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and once I knew it was out, I grabbed my copy very quickly and read through it. And I know Stephanie is, has read through it as well. Mm -hmm. And I have to say at first, I wouldn't so much call this a book as I would a conversation. Yes, Definitely. And I think, I believe that was your intention too, to write it as if it were a conversation. So initially in a chapter, you may, it may echo your thoughts mm -hmm. and then there's a response as if someone was sitting across the table from you mm -hmm. um, over that cup of coffee and just kind of exchanging thoughts. One of the things I also really like is if you look at the table of contents, you can kind of just pick out where you are at any given moment, go mm -hmm. through the table of con contents and just go right to a particular chapter. You don't necessarily have to start at the beginning, mm -hmm. although I love it if you would. For example, <laughs> I wonder who I really am. 
if you're kind of feeling unsettled and lost, there you go. Mm -hmm. Just a rate to that chapter. And you can pick up the other ones later. But it's a wonderful book and as well would be great, I believe, for young adults as well. This would be the mm -hmm. perfect book that you could gift to a teen in your life. Just yeah. gift it to them. And even if you said to them, you don't have to read it cover to cover. That's right. not my aim. Just take it. And anytime you're troubled, confused, look at the table of contents and just go to that chapter. Hmm. All right. So that's my opinion. I love <laughs> this book. I love this book. But I do have some questions, Gary, as you might expect. I think it's in the um, preface when you're talking about you and a little bit of your background. Hmm. In the last paragraph is a sentence, we were born into trouble. Hmm. That one caused my breath to catch. Hmm. I think I know what you mean, but could you share with our listeners what you mean by that statement? That's a really good question. I, I, think, I think one of the things, one of the myths that we all live with is that life should be smooth right? or, or life should be, uh, we, you know, intellectually, we know it's not going to be that way. Intellectually, we know that we're going to have trouble, but it's different when we finally realize that we were born into an imperfect world, into an imperfect family, into an imperfect situation. And many times imperfect doesn't do it justice. We have to use the word broken. A broken world, a broken system, a broken family sometimes. And, but whatever the case is, and even if we have a great and stellar early childhood, we're going to meet trouble pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, we will meet it in relationships at school, or we will meet it in relationships with extended family. And it feels like to me that we have, just in general in our world, it's almost like we've gotten, how do I say this, less adept at dealing with adversity than mm -hmm. we used to be. We yeah. seem to be overall less resilient. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, a loss comes along and it not only knocks us off our feet and keeps us kind of in limbo or semi-paralysis for a while, but we can go on for years with that kind of paralysis because another loss will come and then another loss will come. And I also think, this is just my opinion, I think the world is more broken now than when I was born 60 years ago. I would agree. And so as a result, we are dealing with more brokenness mm -hmm. and more challenges and more trouble than we have ever dealt with before. And that impacts all of us way beyond our personal losses. Mm -hmm. uh, it, in, it influences our personal losses about what kind of support we get and how much. And mm -hmm. it's tough to, it's really tough to recover from a huge personal loss yourself when you feel like the world around you is spinning at such an out of control rate. Right. Exactly. And the changes are so rapid fire and, and you don't know which end is up. Nobody seems to know which end is up. And, and all of that adds up to something mm -hmm. that's really a world gone mad. Mad meaning, I chose the word mad on purpose because that can mean crazy or angry, right? Both. <laughs> yeah. Both, I believe. Yeah. Both. And in our world, I, I do think it's both. It is. So I do believe we are born into trouble. And I think we are better off if we're realistic about that. And we say, chances are, if I look at it, the world is not changing for the better. Right. So therefore, what does that mean for me and my family and the people I love in living daily life? It seems to me, well, I can whine about that. I can complain about that. Um, I can uh, pursue something of the bigger picture, which would be faith, God, where does he fit into all of this? Right. And uh, believe that I am created uh, by God for a purpose. And, you know, no matter how dark it gets, this is the beautiful thing about light, right? The darker right. it gets, the brighter the light seems to shine. Yeah. So anyway, all that from a simple question about one statement in the introduction. Let's see, that's, <laughs> that's exactly why I ask these questions, because the answers are incredible. 
Um, I do want to make sure all of our listeners fully understand that, yes, this is a podcast about grief. And usually we're discussing grief as it relates to having someone we love die. This book, I think, is more about grief in general. And Mm -hmm. I would be willing to bet a lot of money, a lot of money for me anyway, um, (laughs) that probably every single person in the entire world is dealing with grief in one form or another. Yep. Either it's related to the pandemic, it could be related to job loss, to financial problems, to divorce, to family problems, to death. There are so many, many, many things that people have lost lately, even their normal lifestyle. How many times have you heard someone say, I just want it to go back to normal? Mm-hmm. And yeah. In reality, I think the definition of normal, I think we have to change. I think we yeah. have to change that. So I just wanted our listeners to know that if you know someone, anyone that's dealing with grief of any kind, this book is for them, not just in the instance of a death of a loved one. Right. Okay. Yes. So we know you can kind of skip around chapters if you choose. And we know about being born into trouble. Um, That does make sense. But as soon as you say that sentence, we were born into trouble, you also say we will face trouble today. Life is not about getting our way or making things easier somehow. Life is about overcoming. Mm -hmm. So how do we overcome? How do we change that mindset of ours from the whiny person, the angry person, Mm -hmm. to the empowered person? Yes. Now, that is the used to be the $64,000 question. But yeah. <laughs> that's probably nothing in our world with, I don't know. You know, that's the big question. I, I do believe, I really believe that so much of life is about overcoming. Mm-hmm. And one of the things about this book, the reason, I tr- the reason I chose to write this book was for the very things, Kathy, that you just shared. I was, everybody that I was talking to was overwhelmed with grief. And we're not talking about people who had lost loved ones. We're talking about the person next door here, the person across the street. And I would listen to them and they'd just be so frustrated. And I say, I would say, it sounds like you're grieving. And they would go, what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say, well, uh, you've lost the world as you know it. And, you know, you just list a bunch of losses and they go, oh. Yeah. So everybody's apple cart has kind of been upset Mm -hmm. and turned upside down. Everybody's world is different. Right. And it is very difficult to overcome anything if you don't have a strong sense of hope. Right. Mm-hmm. A strong sense of hope. And that strong sense of hope, and, and here, here is where my, my pastoral and faith background is going to come into play heavily, of course, yep. is that if the hope is just based on me, mm-hmm. that's, a pretty, that's a pretty small hope. Yep. I, mean, I, I mean, that's a tiny hope. Mm-hmm. And if it's based on the people around me who are imperfect and broken, just like me, then chances are I'm going to get really disappointed. And my sense of hope is going to disappear and then reappear and then disappear and reappear until I finally just settle into despair somewhere because I'm constantly disappointed. Or to begin to look at the bigger picture and to begin to ask, are are there some things or someone that we can really hope in, that can provide some honest to goodness, sure and certain hope. And one of the things that the book really deals with is, why do our losses hurt so much? Well, it's because there's this deep longing within us, this longing to be known, to be loved, to love, to be safe, to be secure, to know things that are going going to be okay somehow and to live with purpose and meaning and have impact for good. I mean, that's all, all those things are longings that bounce around all of our hearts. As much as we would like to say death is a part of life, there's, there's a truth to that state, statement. But in the same way, death is not really a friend to us when it comes to our relationship. It separates us, at least temporarily, from the people that we love. 
even though death sometimes can be a relief if we've got a situation of disease and terrible suffering and, and all of those all of those other things. Mm -hmm. So this book is really, as you said, a conversation designed to walk someone from grieving the loss of a loved one to considering some of the deeper longings of their heart and to consider how God might fit into that and uh, what that meant, might mean for them, for mm -hmm. their grief process, for their healing, for their relationships, etc. So ultimately, I believe that Jesus Christ is the ultimate overcomer. And so if I know him and I know him well enough, I just figure, you know, I hope some of that overcoming rubs off on me, right? <laughs> because, and I think, I think it can, and I think it can for anyone. It is hard to continue to keep overcoming. Mm -hmm. There's many times when I just kind of want to run the white flag up and to say, everybody just stop. Yep. Everything, everything just stop. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. It never stops. And so at those times when I'm frequently at the end of myself, we all need to have someone that never comes to the end of themselves. Okay. Who is inexhaustible and limitless and that we can count on mm -hmm. even in the midst of a broken world where we don't understand why it's so broken and we don't right. understand why things go the way they do. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I agree. I agree. I know many people, and I'm going to say that uh, even though I consider myself incredibly unique, <laughs> I, I knew I'd get a laugh out of that. I knew Stephanie would chuckle at the very least. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really quite typical, I think, in, in the way that over the last decades, plural, since I was a child, I was brought up as a child in the Episcopal faith, church every Sunday every Sunday, Sunday school, youth group, choir, our family life revolved around church and our faith. And it's very easy in that situation to nod your head and say, yep, to mm -hmm. recite all of the prayers. And, you know, in the Episcopal faith, if people don't know, they have a book of common prayer. They don't generally speak prayer from their hearts. They generally recite what has already been written for them. So as a child, of course, you recite all these words and maybe you try to make some meaning of them. Maybe you just recite them because that's what everybody else in the congregation is doing. And then as I grew up, actually, with two small children and on my own, pretty much, I found the Southern Baptist religion. And I was literally blown away because it was more by invitation. They invited me to join them. They were happy that we joined them. They prayed what was in their heart. They used their own words. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was incredibly amazing. They didn't baptize infants. They gave them to the church as infants. They gifted their child to the church so that the church could help raise that child. And then when the child was old enough to accept Jesus as their savior, then the child, usually in their early teens or preteens, was baptized, or sometimes someone was baptized as an adult. Entirely different experience. But once you stop going to church regularly, seeds of doubt tend to creep in until years and years have gone by, mm -hmm. and you find yourself kind of further removed from that religion and that belief such that you're kind of questioning all of this. And Gary, the point I'm trying to make is I expect there are a lot of people out there like me that maybe as children, they were brought up in a specific religion or at a specific church family. And then as they grew up and they got independent and well, you know, life is life and you get away from it. It's hard to just all of a sudden say, oh yeah, I accept that. Your book, your conversation so gently leads people through quoting scripture, through a very easy process, leads people back into everything you learned and believed in previously, and just helps you reaffirm that yes, yes, 
this is what I believe. And you accept it again. And I loved that about mm. your book and your mm. writing, because yeah. I found myself going through it. And I thought, well, you know, I know this already. I know this. Where's it been? I forgot. <laughs> I forgot. So it was nice to have all of that before me to just kind of say, yeah, it's it's been here all along, Kathy. Where have you been? <laughs> it's been right there waiting for me. So thank you for that. One of your chapters is called, What Are We Chasing? And mm. I really love that one, Gary. What are we all chasing? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, the first thing that pops into my head is an old country and Western song. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, I'm not going to sing it. Okay. But look, <laughs> well, you could. <laughs> look, looking for love. Yep. And all, all the wrong places. Places. <laughs> yeah. We're looking for love in all the wrong places. Mm-hmm. Or um, we we will. Okay. Here, here's just what I think. Uh-huh. But I, I hope that what I think is informed by the Bible. I, I I believe that it is. Is that human beings are created in the image of God. We are each, as you said, Kathy, unique in all of human history. Each yeah. one of us. Yeah. And we were designed to worship the one who created us. And I believe every human being worships. It just depends on what or mm-hmm. who. Right. And sometimes it can be multiple things and right. multiple people in any given day. Anything that we give our hearts to, that we say, this is my life. This is going to, this is going to make everything better. Mm-hmm. This person is going to make everything better. This will give me relief from, you know, whatever the case, whatever, whatever it is. And what happens is, of course, we live our lives for quick fixes, Mm -hmm. whatever they are, instead of because and I think we do that because there's something very stubborn in all of us Mm. that we want to do this ourselves and we want to choose what we want to choose. And we're not going to bow to anybody Mm -hmm. or anything. But yet we do every day, mm-hmm. you know, because we're worshiping someone or something, no matter what we're doing. So I think we chase a lot of different things, looking for love, mm-hmm. security, peace, belonging, healing, you name it. But I think the big thing is looking for unconditional love, safety, and then meaning and purpose. Mm-hmm. I, I think... We chase after those things, but so often we don't know that that's what we're chasing for right. because that's evident in the things that we chase because they will never, <laughs> the things that we chase will never fulfill any of that right. for right. us. That's right. That's right. That's um, right. So many memories came back to me when I was reading your book, mainly of my mother, who was mm. a devout Episcopalian. Stephanie's smiling. Mm-hmm. The listeners can't see this, but Stephanie has <laughs> a very wide grin on her face thinking about her grandma. And it was going to be done her way, and her way was usually the church's way, and, and all that's okay. She, she loved to go to Bible study at church. And I remember there was one time they introduced a new format to Bible study. <laughs> My mother was furious <laughs> because it was... And it, it was simple, really, because you had to read the passage. So somebody would read it in the Bible study. And then they would go around the group, around the circle, and just say, what did this mean to you? Well, my mother was really upset because when she said, most times she couldn't put into words what it meant mm. to her. And so I admit, and everybody, I think, would admit that depending on the version of Bible you have in front of you, it can be a very daunting read. Yes. And yeah. that's why sometimes getting it by scripture, when, like in your book, when it's applicable to a certain feeling or certain emotion or certain question, that's really helpful. Mm-hmm. But also in your book, in your conversation with people about hope in a world gone mad, you even suggest to people to pick up the Bible and start reading it. And you specifically tell them to start with the Gospel of Luke. Not start with Genesis, the beginning, Adam and Eve. Forget all that for the moment. Go right to the Gospel of Luke. So you know what my question is, Gary. Why? <laughs> Why 
Why the Gospel of Luke? I think several reasons. I think people can get bogged down very quickly uh, in the Old Testament. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the Old Testament. I really do love it. But I think people can get bogged down. And when they don't understand something that we feel embarrassed if we don't understand something. I don't know what it is about us, Mm -hmm. except for the really curious people out there, like my wife, that if she doesn't understand something, she'll say, I don't get this. What does it mean? And she'll, (laughs) she'll ask. But most people, especially guys, are not going to do that. If they don't understand something, it's just like, man, this is harder than I thought it was. And so Luke, Luke, I appreciate Luke. Why? Well, for me, most of the New Testament writers were Jewish. They were Jewish believers in Jesus Christ. But Luke is not. Luke is a Gentile. Uh, He was Greek by descent. He was a doctor. He was a physician, and he begins his account by saying, I'm writing this to you, my dear friend Theophilus. Apparently, this was one person he was writing this for, and so I'm glad the rest of us got a hold of it, Um, (laughs) and he says, I wrote this so that you would know I have carefully investigated all of these things so that you might have an orderly and reliable account of Jesus Christ, what he did, and what happened. So physicians tend to be a little anal. You know, they they tend to, they tend, they want it right, right? And then they will keep working on it until it's right. So here we have a first century physician Mm -hmm. writing this book, and he is fascinated with the healings because they're everywhere in the book of Luke. And he's also very careful about conversations. It's just a great historical account it's a great starting point for someone right it's almost like if somebody were to say to me and i use this illustration all the time they say i read the bible but i i just i just don't understand it you know i read it in the morning and by noon i can't even remember what i read Mm -hmm. and my the the thing i will ask them was uh what did you have for uh, what did you have for dinner uh (laughs) two-thirds What did you have for dinner two Thursdays ago? <laughs> yeah. And they just stare at me like, why are you asking me that? And I said, well, what if, if you didn't, do you have the same thing for breakfast every day? No. Well, what'd you have for breakfast uh, s- seven days ago? <laughs> I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Well, the point is, of course, this person is alive and healthy partially because of the food that they have eaten that they no right. longer remember. Right. right. But it came into them and did its job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so there is something mysterious. If the, if the Bible is really God's word, then I believe it has power. Mm-hmm. And I believe it can nourish us in ways that we are not aware, even if we don't understand what's right. going on. The other thing to remember is, of course, Jesus told his disciples all the time, okay, guys, I'm about to tell you this, but you're not going to get it right now. <laughs> you're not going to, you're not going to understand this, but later you will understand. Mm -hmm. So I often tell people, read it, but read it with your ears. Listen as if Jesus Christ himself is speaking to you because he is. Mm -hmm. So just listen. And, you know, don't don't take it too, uh, this is, I want to say don't take it too seriously, but (laughs) you you know what I mean by that. I mean, I think- There's not a test. Right. Yes. There's not a written test. There is there is a test. <laughs> I think at different times too, certain things are gonna resonate more with you and might stay mm-hmm. with you, even though yes. you know, a year ago maybe it didn't. So mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. Now Gary, yeah. I read the ebook of yours and it's it is literally like reading a conversation and it, it reads so easy and so fast. So I think definitely mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Get the book and, you know, I read it from front to back, but then it's certainly something that you can leave on, on a table. And then like, like mom said, when you're feeling something, look at the chapter and go back and read something again, just, you know, but anyways, with, with the ebook, there was a link for us to grab another thing. And I was emailed and it, it's called, what is going on? <laughs> I got it. I got it. And I looked at that and I was kind of skimming it and everything. But the part that hit me 
was, and I'm going to paraphrase this. It says, it looks and feels like chaos. And I totally feel like that is us in our world today. And then it says, yes, indeed, the result of this wholesale rejection of God is increasing dysfunction, division, violence, and lawlessness. We reap what we sow. We're now reaping what we've sown. And the sad news is that it's going to get worse. Worse? How could it get any worse? Even as I say that, I know it can get worse. We haven't hit bottom yet, have we? It says, no, we haven't. How, I know that you mentioned hope before, but knowing, I mean, like this pandemic, we, we've we decided everybody is going through some sort of grief. It has been, what has it been, two and a half years now? It feels yes. like forever. I, it does feel like forever. And knowing that it, we haven't probably hit bottom yet, that's hard. I mean, it's, it's truthful, I'm sure. <laughs> But that's hard to accept. What could help people to kind of keep trying to carry on and make it through knowing there's probably still a downfall? Yes. Oh, boy, that's such a big question. I know. (laughs) Uh, But it's such a a good one. I'm going to speak personally for a moment and just say that there are and and many listening now can probably relate to some of these things there are at least three or four times in my life where i thought that's it i have reached bottom Mm -hmm. i have reached bottom of course now i look back and go i didn't have a clue anyway (laughs) um but i I really thought uh, I have reached bottom or whatever it is, has reached bottom. The end has come, mm-hmm. you know, for whatever, whatever it is where I was lovingly invited, I believe by God with the question, who are you going to trust in here? You can try to figure it out. You can try to work your way out of it. You can try to dig your way out of this pit or you can trust me and have hope in me and in ultimately me alone and not in your circumstances, not in your situations, because none of us are in control of that, but we think we are. Mm -hmm. And, and we, uh, it's, it's amazing how long we will stay in denial about certain things. I'm talking about me here, Mm -hmm. you know, stay in denial about, Oh, that'll never, nah, Mm -hmm. You know, and oh, that can't happen here. <laughs> nah, you know, and all of those other things. And then I look at the Bible about faithful people who trusted in God in the midst of impossible situations mm-hmm. that make what we're going through right now look like a cakewalk. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just being blunt. I mean, what we're going through is terrible. Don't get me wrong. Right. I'm not trying to minimize that at right. all but where every single day they didn't know if they were going to make it literally or their families or their kids or their, and yet these people, when they pray are not praying for deliverance. They're not praying for relief. They are praying things like, Oh Lord, consider the threats of this world and give your servants boldness that we might love and speak more boldly. Mm -hmm. And I think, Oh my, So for all of us, wouldn't it be nice? Let me paint the picture this way. Wouldn't it be nice to have trust in someone that we trusted was working even in the midst of this chaos Mm -hmm. for our good that we can't see yet, but that one day we will see and trust in him and rest in that and begin to live with peace and joy no matter what is happening around us or sometimes even to us. That's hard for us to imagine being able to endure that. But I think the words of Jesus come in here where he tells his disciples, look guys, someday, and he's really speaking to us too, when they arrest you, when they put you in prison, do not worry about what to do or what to say, Mm -hmm. for it will be given you at that time. What 
to do or what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but it will be the spirit of your father speaking through you. That's the whole point is that we find ourselves and who we really are by discovering who God really is because he created us and he's the only one who really knows. And by following him, we begin to live a, a life firmly planted in this world with both eyes on heaven at the same time. And that, over time, transforms us to be more like Jesus so that we are more of the overcomers that we were designed to be. Now, I don't know if that, I'm just rambling here, so I don't know if any of that made any sense. But I really think it's it comes down to, it's scary. You know, people, I don't, I can't believe this picture is coming to mind. Oh my goodness. It's it's one of the Indiana Jones movies. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, it wait, will help wait, people relate. We're, we're <laughs> listening forward, Indiana Jones or somebody they're they're at this they're at this chasm, right? And I can't remember the exact thing, but the idea was the hint that they found was a leap of faith. Mm-hmm. A leap of faith. And he's this chasm and he goes, a leap of faith. And he steps out into the chasm and he doesn't fall because there's actually a ledge there that they can't see until they step on it. Yeah. And so that's, but that's a great picture yeah. of faith mm-hmm. in that if we, most of us want to live a, a life that doesn't require any faith at all. Mm-hmm. We want to know everything, mm-hmm. right. <laughs> be able to do it. But, but the fact of the matter is sometimes there's a time when we have to step out and we have to say, I don't want to live based on circumstances and situations anymore. That makes me miserable. I I want to live beyond all of that. Mm-hmm. But I think that's impossible to do without God, because otherwise we're just left to our own, my, my own little pea brain gray cells here <laughs> that I'm grabbing my head for those of you who can't see me right now. <laughs> Um, and, and, and we all know how that winds up, right? When we all, all when we all take up. control of our own right. lives, we know how that winds up. That that's right. You know, if somebody came along with something called a brain sucker and stuck it on stuck it on my head, I'm afraid it might be. <laughs> and, uh, <sighs> well, I hate to say it, and I always hate to say it, but especially today, I would just I would be so happy to sit here for hours and listen to you and just chat back and forth it's always so enlightening for me and and healing for me in so Mm. many ways but the time has come Gary when we're going to (laughs) give you just a few moments so you can speak directly to our listeners let them know what's going on in your world Um, I would guess that uh, maybe you got another book or two up your sleeve (laughs) at some point so anything you'd like to share and maybe even invite our listeners to contact you through your website and get, because you have a number of free uh, handouts for Mm -hmm. them. So I'm turning it over to you. Yes. Uh, Please feel free to come uh, visit me on my website. It's Gary Rowe, G-A-R-Y-R-O-E.com. And uh, if you go there, there'll be a free ebook that pops up after about eight seconds called Crisis. But there's, there's another page uh, it's called resources, and there's a number of free resources, ebooks, an email uh, course, um, some other things there. And you can just look through those and ask yourself, which one of these seems to resonate most with me? Just looking at it, reading the description and uh, download it and see what you think, um, because chances are we all resonate with different voices. And if you resonate with my voice through something that's free on my website, then chances are you're going to resonate with a Mm -hmm. book as well. Exactly. I also have this commitment that if you ever want to ask me anything, I read and respond to every email. Sometimes it takes me a little while, but uh, I always try to get get back to people. So Mm -hmm. feel free to do that because I think this is really all about relationship. Mm -hmm. And I don't don't know how it can be about relationship if we're not having a conversation of some kind. Exactly. Exactly. Well yeah. said. Well, so I guess now all that's left for me is to say our normal farewell and wrap wrap up. But today I'm going to make it a little bit shorter and a little bit different, especially after our conversation. I'm going to encourage every one of you to grab this book by Gary, Hope in a World Gone Mad. 
I know you can get it on Amazon. It's available for Kindle. I don't care where you get it, how you get it, but get it and read it. It will give you a lot of comfort. Mm -hmm. I guarantee it. So I'm going to sign off then with just a single word, which for those of you who may not realize it, this one word means so be it. Amen.